Okay, hi, Paolo. Hi, how you doing? I'm doing fine. And how's things on your side? Uh, it's going pretty well here. You know, pretty much been up to the same thing every day, which is um, take caring or t- taking care of our dogs that we have here. We got two dogs and uh, just kind of keeping up our routine, you know, whether it's doing press, trying to work out at home, you know, the, the, the things just to kind of keep us sane and keep things a little routine, you know, not get bored. Where are you based? Uh, is it L.A., Florida? I live in Chicago. Uh, but nice. the band is based in Florida. That's like my home state. I'm from South Florida, but I'm living up here right now. And, um, you know, the band's still in Orlando. Matt and Corey are down there. And Alex lives out in California. So when it's time to rehearse, we all come together in Orlando. Okay, great. Um, I just want to introduce um, to our audience that I'm now talking to Paolo, bassist from Trivium. Just to let everyone know that, you know, Metal Hammer magazine dubbed Trivium quite simply one of the best bands in modern metal. Okay? Yeah, it's, uh, and, um, it's a lot to live up to. <laughs> yeah, and, and um, you guys just released your ninth album, Yeah, What the Dead Men Say, on April 24th. And we just want to get down to the nuts and bolts of it. Yes. Um, be, but before we do that, I think we just have to talk about the the situation at hand, which mm-hmm. is this COVID-19, um, which is just incredible. Um, how are you coping and adjusting to life in the middle of this pandemic? I mean, you know, obviously being at home, I'm, I'm very thankful, like, you know, to have a place to live and to have family, to have like, you know, dogs and pets to kind of hang out with while we're here. So I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm doing very well. Um, It's just really crazy to not know what's happening, obviously, with touring and stuff like that. And sort of, you know, we're trying to as a band, stay engaged with fans, we wanted to make sure that this week, we were out, And, uh, you know, doing whatever we could, like yesterday we did a virtual signing, you know, sold a bunch of CDs, signed it for them, talked to people, you know, trying to give people something to look forward to and still entertain people. And obviously Matt still has his Twitch going so people can see him jam on there. And I think this summer um, we're going to be doing a lot more streaming type stuff like that as well, like full band performances. But we're just kind of waiting to get to the point where it feels like safe enough to at least travel again within the States and, um, yeah, just take it from there. It's kind of a, a day by day thing. Do you recall the moment that um, COVID nineteen was becoming a threat? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I on like personally, when um, the first city or two in in China shut down, I the first thing I did was like get online and I looked up some masks to buy because I was like, this is going to all sell out very quick, and I kind of. Uh, I, from fl- like Florida has hurricanes every year. And so like, you have to kind of get ready like last minute. And I just feel like I've always kind of had that sort of like just living through a bunch of hurricanes, like, you know, to go and get the supplies be- before everyone rushes out the day before it hits, you know? And so I was just like, this is going to come here obviously because air travel and just the way things are. And, um, you know, I was getting all that stuff in hopes of like, okay, well, I'll have to wear masks. And, you know, when we travel over to Asia and over to Europe, I'll just have to kind of do what we did when the swine flu was going around in 2009. And then it became obvious that this was more serious. Uh, You know, obviously, when we had to start discussing postponing shows, uh, it really kind of hit home. And finally, a day or two before Matt was actually supposed to fly up to Chicago for an event for Mortal Kombat, um, we were going to fly to Europe and do press and we had to pull the plug because it was like, okay, this is becoming very serious. Um, you know, we, we need to just kind of rethink how we're going to promote this this record. And after that, it was kind of like, okay, this is not going to be a normal year. This is going to change. So this was like in Feb, right? Yeah. About February. I definitely felt that things were not going to happen as planned, pretty early on, but I was trying to kind of stay hopeful at least that something could happen. But it it just kept seeming like, you know, there's no way this is going to be something that doesn't affect everyone in the world. So we have to to kind of prepare for that. The virus has, you know, caused, you know, the live entertainment industry to collapse in a way that we have never seen before. It's not just like country specific, Mm -hmm. but, you know, 
it's just for our for our business, Paolo, you know, the whole entertainment industry. Yeah. It just, you know, it's a catastrophe. Mm-hmm. You know? So, you know, we're all sitting here every day, like every 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 day, you know, you know, your agent <laughs> other agents reach out to us. Okay, can we be looking at this date and this yeah. date? And 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 truth be told, um, we don't know when, you know, when is the right time to mm-hmm. get everything going, right? When do you actually have an inclination that you know you'll go on tour? Yeah. In 2020, will 2020 be? I don't know. With the rest of this year, I'm, you know, I'm hopeful. Obviously, that things will get to a point where we could tour later this year. But I'm. It just seems like really, you know, when you listen to the experts talk about like the way things work, it just doesn't seem like a possibility. Uh, and in my opinion, I would rather scrap the rest of the year and hope that, you know, the the following year could get back to some sort of normalcy rather than rush back and then have to start all over again. And then, you know, have this really become a thing that like just affects the rest of next year. So mm-hmm. I think that's kind of the thing. But the problem is, um, you know, I, I think a lot of people are getting really antsy already just having to stay inside and I don't know about in Singapore, but definitely in America, people get really, I don't know, it, when they're told to do you know something for the greater good, people are not really always the best at listening to advice. And, uh, you know, we haven't really had a real lockdown here. It's really kind of been a hodgepodge of things. So we'll see how that goes. I don't know. Maybe people are just going to be like, well, this is just how it is right now and, and tough it out. And But I'm like, they're already talking about opening things back up here and it's only been a few weeks. So I don't know. I'm not really sure what's going to happen. I have a feeling that we'll be touring overseas um, before we tour in the States, but that's just my prediction. I think th- there could be a chance that we'll be able to go to places that have it under control better and that the States is going to be like dealing with it for a little bit longer. In the U.S., some of the States have already opened. In Chicago... Some did never closed. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. So that's, that's right. kind of the issue, closed. you know, kind of hard yeah. when... Uh, like half the places don't listen or do anything. And mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's it's kind of weird. I mean, I don't know. I wasn't, I didn't expect a, a good response, but uh, it is pretty shocking to see people just kind of like, I don't know, just kind of pretending it, it's not an issue. So we'll see, you know, <laughs> maybe they just won't, they're just not counting people getting sick or dying. So I guess that's the way they're going to do it here. I, th- I think the count in, um, in the U.S. right now, it's close to a million, right? That has the COVID nineteen. Yeah, and and Something they're not like doing, that. and that's just with like minimal testing. We, it's probably much worse than that. So, wow. it's uh, yikes, definitely shocking, um, but not mm-hmm. surprising either. So it's, <laughs> I, I guess, uh, you know, that was like my, my one thing when I saw what was happening in China and why I wanted to start getting like supplies and masks and things like that because I'm like, I just know there's not going to be anyone there to kind of like handle that for you here. It's kind of like you're on your own. So, you know, getting it in advance, like, I mean, even like things like uh, webcam, like I had to get a new webcam before all of the press and stuff and like everything just sold out immediately. And I got in just in time just to get one of the last like good ones that I could get. But it's just, yeah, it's pretty crazy. Paolo, we just want to talk about the new album now. Mm -hmm. When did the band start working on this new album? And can you take us through through the process? Yeah, we started officially demoing together in March of last year. Uh, You know, we pretty much, I would say, probably started writing riffs a lot longer before then. But, you know, when we start actually getting into the studio or our our jam room, I guess I should say, um, that's when we count the official start. So we wrote about three songs together, then... You know, we came back about a couple months later, did another three songs. We went out on tour in Europe, came back together, did another three songs or whatever. And we, we were pretty much just splitting up the process so that we wouldn't have to write like everything in one go. And, you know, we got into the studio in October of last year with Josh Wilbur once again. And, you know, pretty much nailed everything down in about 16 days. And then we did drums last and we did that out in LA at 606 which is like the Foo Fighters studio uh their mm-hmm. personal studio and that's where we did drums and that was kind of cool because we did drums last this time which was the first time we ever did that and it was actually kind of a nice way to I guess track things 
how did the decision come with working with George Wilbur? Mm-hmm. How did you decide on that? Uh, well, we worked with him on the last record uh, for production. And then on Silence in the Snow, he mixed the record. And that's how we got to really connect with him again. We had met him a long time ago, but... You know, Silence in the Snow was kind of our connection with Josh. The Sin in the Sentence was like such a breakthrough album for us, and we loved working with him. So it just kind of made sense to continue. And, you know, he's just really got the right attitude and vibe, and he's such a skilled, you know, not only producer, but an engineer. He's like, you know, the knowledge he has and just how effortless it, it is to kind of just get in there and get, like, good tones and just start working right away. He's just got the right... Uh, set of skills for us. I love the title track, um, What the Dead Men Say. Mm-hmm. It's just phenomenal. How did the band come up with the name of, you know, the album, What the Dead yeah. Men Say? Yeah, you know, when I'm like doing like, I guess I, you could say research for lyrics, like I'm always like keeping an eye out for things that are just interesting, whether it's like some words I see in an article or a title of something, a book, a movie or whatever that just seems like it could be interesting for for, like future use. Um, I'll jot it down on my phone. And um, this happened to be a Philip K. Dick short story, the the science fiction writer, Philip K. Dick. And I, you know, always loved his work. And uh, it was kind of like a really unknown short story, like from like the 50s or something. And but I just loved the title. And you know, some of the lyrics on that song were kind of fitting into that sort of, um, I guess you could say, altered state science fiction-y type uh, vibe. And, you know, that would be the perfect title for the song, in my opinion. And I was like, I definitely want to keep this title uh, around just in case there's a song that needs it. And when we started writing the song that would become What the Dead Men Say, we we had to take two demos and essentially put them together because we needed like more riffs. And we wrote that chorus pretty much on the spot. Like we, we started like jamming the chords and I'm like, Hey, I got this cool title. I think it would fit. And so Matt and I kind of took turns kind of singing the part to kind of find the right, um, you know, the cadence and how it would work. And we just jammed around that and it came together so well. And, Definitely one of my favorite titles and choruses on the record. It's just really, really powerful and different. I I like that it kind of like evokes a lot of imagination out of people listening to it, like what it could mean. And I kind of like to keep it sort of open-ended of like what the meaning is. And I think even the title and the, the story itself probably are the same. You know, it's kind of an open interpretation. Um, is it correct to say that that's your favorite track on the album? It's tough to say because like every song really kind of has its own vibe and just listening start to finish, you know, it's 40, about 45 minutes worth of music. So it's like not super long. And I always just find myself wanting to just kind of let it go and just listen through because I, I do feel like every song serves a purpose on this record. Okay, fantastic. Um, I wanted to now get into touring. Mm-hmm. How you prepare yourself and, you know, what the band does. Uh, I mean, before going on tour, of course, we do a lot of rehearsal at our at our like jam room. Um, You know, that is like the crucial part of it, because, you know, if you don't do a lot of preparation before the tour, uh, just it, it. it becomes kind of a nightmare because, you know, when you go out on tour, if you're not ready, if you're not prepared, if you haven't been rehearsing, your first couple shows are going to be really sloppy uh, you're not going to have your sound dialed in. And we know we just realized over the years, like how important it is to really go in prepared, even if you don't want to play, you know, a set list a couple days in a row. You know, it, it gets tiring to to do practice uh, off tour because you have played a song a thousand times. Then you're just worried about like just your general warm up, which is like vocal warm ups, stretching, that kind of thing. You know, I like to make sure that the majority of the work is done before the tour, not like while we're out there. Nice. Okay. Um, One thing I'm always curious is how did the bands actually come up with the decision on the set list at Mm -hmm. shows? Is that during Um, rehearsal? Yeah, definitely during rehearsal. I think a lot of it comes down to what new songs we play from whatever album we're touring on. Um, Like the last record, 
people were really stoked on it. There's a couple songs that like, you know, you got to play like a song like in waves, you know, or something like down from the sky. There's like a certain song that like people, you know, if you went to go see Metallica, like you definitely want to see like master puppets or something, you know, there's like certain staples of the set. So like you put those into the set and then from there, it kind of it comes down to picking which old songs fit very well with the new songs, um, kind of crafting a set that flows very well, that doesn't feel like it's ever losing steam and, you know, knowing where to put in a song, like until the world goes cold to kind of bring it down a little bit after we played a bunch of fast songs, you're kind of like balancing things out. And then of course, you know, maybe playing one or two deep cuts for like the fans that like know every single song and have been dying to see something that hasn't been played or hasn't been played in a while in the set. Do you miss touring? <clears throat> I mean, yeah, definitely. Uh, I feel like we had a long break last year because Matt had his uh, children. And so we were off tour for quite a while for that. And we did get a little bit of touring in last summer on the festivals. We played in Australia last December. And those were the last shows we've played since this all went down. You know, we were hoping obviously to come to Asia and those were going to be the first few shows of this album cycle. And it's definitely, uh, you know, we're very bummed out about it. Uh, we love to travel. We love to play the shows. And, we, you know, obviously it's out of our hands. So, you know, we know fans understand that <laughs> it, it's just what it is. But, you know, I feel like every month we're going to probably miss it more and more. So um, I'm, I'm just stoked to be able to play some uh, rehearsals, you know, play like do some rehearsal streams, like get on there and just like play and like stream out a set maybe of us playing or something at some point this summer you know we haven't even played or rehearsed and that's like for us a a weird thing because normally we're always rehearsing we'll get together once a month you know even when we're off tour and we haven't played since uh december it's crazy wow fans have been waiting to see trivium in concert especially here in asia what can you tell your many fans do you have any messages for them obviously this Cancellation was like incredibly, uh, you know, shocking to us. So like we we were so looking forward to coming down and playing some shows, you know, not only in places we've been like Japan, but like, of course, Singapore, Thailand, Indonesia. And, you know, there's so many places we want to play there. We know we have a ton of fans that have been waiting years for us to come. And, you know, this is a setback for the moment. But, you know, we're going to reschedule and we're going to play shows when we can and I mean, it's hard to say the state of the world, you know, but if things are at least better sometime next year, I hope that we can at least come back and, and make right and uh, get back to some sort of normalcy, whatever that is, you know, when we get through this. We're going to just um, take some questions from the fans. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a question from Quinn Lim. And he's asking uh, you, Paolo, is there anyone in mind that Trivium would like to collaborate on a song with? Kind of like a dude that I think is an incredible singer that he helped us out uh, at one of the shows when Matt couldn't be there when he was having uh, his children uh, was um, uh, Brandon from Atreyu. I think he's got such a great voice. He's, you know, obviously a great drummer, but incredible vocals. And uh, that'd be cool. You know, I think... Uh, he he's a guy that like could bring something out of a song that like, you know, having another voice in there, especially as good as his w could do. So maybe, you know, maybe down the line, we'll do something fun like that. I could see us doing a one off, maybe single or song, maybe not on a record, but something just kind of for fun, you know, with maybe a guest vocalist, you know, because we haven't done it before. We have another uh, question from <clears throat> uh, John and uh, Gina Dykes. And they're just asking you about your taste in food and mm. um, Southeast Asian food. Yes. Everyone knows about Matt, you know, being mm -hmm. a super foodie. foodie saint, but same for, for me. And I feel like, you know, Alex and Corey definitely uh, get in on the, the food experiences with us. You know, that's like one big thing about touring for us is like we always make sure to go out and have like, I guess you could say family dinners with a us and our crew you know not all, all the time with the crew sometimes they like to do their own thing but that was one thing i was looking forward to with coming to singapore because i know about i think what are they like those like kind of halls where they have like all the food and stuff in them like i've been wanting to do that for a long time so uh we'll, we'll get down there and do it you know it just uh <laughs> have to wait you know at the moment just been cooking at home and uh that's about as uh 
exciting as my food experiences have been. It's just kind of uh, making food and hanging out. I'm just I'm intrigued when you say cooking at home. What what are you cooking? Um, let's see. I, kind of like, you know, my girlfriend and I, we've kind of been like, uh, you know, we haven't been eating out. We haven't been getting takeout. So we just will kind of like, you know, order a bunch of like different meats and stuff. And we'll like prep them with like different seasonings, chicken, fish, everything. Uh, my big thing lately been the blackened mahi-mahi fish. That's been my my favorite thing that we make at home. And um, yeah, it's been it's been good. It's probably been healthier to eat a lot at home. I haven't been really have been drinking that much. Uh, I don't know why. I just kind of haven't had a beer in a while. But uh, I'm sure once once uh, we get back out and stuff, uh, it'll be nice to have beers and stuff again. Definitely another favorite of mine. Uh, trying different beers in different countries. Okay, we have an Instagram question from um, Reggae. I think Reg, Rage Kyle, and he says, um, "Have you ever gotten a burnout? Burnout from like have, touring? Yeah, Pref- <clears throat> you know, yeah. Um, definitely. You know, physically, I, I feel like I have. Uh, you know, if you get it sick on tour, that's really easy to kind of just feel like checked out. Um, but even when I've ever felt sick, like when we play the show, it's sort of like this m- magical like medicine that like at least makes you feel good for an hour where I like maybe I don't feel the best, but like I kind of get that adrenaline and it makes me happy to be up on stage. Uh, even when the show's over, and I might feel like crap after. It's just nice to be able to get up there and play. So I never feel burnout out from the shows, but like, you know, the same sort of monotony every day of like the – you know, the, the schedule we have, the set list we play, like that can be a little wearing on you. But the show and seeing people like excited is always the thing that kind of, you know, makes everything good for the day. Like any sort of like burnout I have is sort of wiped away with the show. We have a question from Matt Solagod. Mm-hmm. And he says, um, what bass effects um, do you use in songs such as IX, the title track and mm-hmm. the Defiant? Honestly, it's the same tones I use for the rest of the record. It's my Kemper, which is, for anyone that doesn't know what a Kemper is, it's like a digital amp modeler. Um, So I have an Ampeg SVD classic model tone. Um, I use a Warwick bass, and I have an EBS multiband compressor. So pretty much what that does is, obviously, if you understand the concept of compression with sound, it it flattens things to where it's all one level. But what you can do with the multiband compressor is that if you don't want to flatten the low end, which is obviously for bass, you don't want to lose a lot of that low end, you can leave it a little bit more open on that side of it. So that's kind of really it. It's it's really down to just the way I play it. Uh, the tone comes from how how I strike the strings and I like to keep things simple, and it was nice to use my live rig in the studio. I think it probably my favorite tone I've ever had on a record. So there's not really any crazy effects or anything. Okay, I think um, I think that's about it, and Paolo. Ooh, I think um, thank you. Yeah, wish the band all the best, and thank you. Just hope that we can um, resume back to our normal business. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it'll be very nice when we can, you know. And we're we're definitely looking forward to coming coming down there. Um, it's going to happen eventually at some point, you know, it just, we're very, we were very disappointed. Uh, we couldn't get there and, you know, I, so many fans are always hitting us up from Singapore and asking us to come. So we really appreciate the support and, you know, we're going to get down. We will come, you know, and, uh, we'll, we'll make right for the lost time. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much, Paolo. Thank you for your Thank time. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Take care.